Hello to everyone in the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral community and all of our friends. This is Father Jonathan. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to continue our series on the lives of the saints. And on this, the 21st of, of January, we keep the memory of our venerable father, Maximus, the confessor. St. Maximus was born into one of the great families of Constantinople in 580, endowed with an exceptional intellect, an intelligence, and an uncommon ability for high philosophical speculation. He completed his studies with great distinction and embarked on a political career. The Emperor Heraclius, on coming to the throne in 610, appointed him as chief secretary. But honor, power, and riches could not quench the secret longing of Maximus since his youth to lead a life in keeping with the true philosophy. He resigned his post after only three years and became a monk in the monastery of the Mother of God at Chrysopolis. Well prepared for spiritual battle through the meditation on Holy Scripture and the study of the Holy Fathers, he climbed steadily up the ladder of virtues leading to blessed impassibility. He overcame the impulses of lust through well-regulated ascuses and of anger through meekness, freeing his mind thereby from the tyranny of the passions. He nourished his intellect through prayer, raising it peaceably to the heights of contemplation. In the silence of his cell, gazing into the abyss of his heart, he considered within himself the great mystery of our salvation, whereby the word of God, moved by his infinite love for mankind, has condescended to unite himself to our nature, which is separated from God and divided against itself by self-centered love. He has thus restored the unity of our nature, brought in the reign of brotherly love and concord among men, and opened to us the way of union with God, for God is love. Having thus spent twelve years in Isichia, in stillness, he settled with his disciple Anastasius, in a small monastery of St. George at Syzicus. It was there that his earliest works were written, ascetic treatises on the struggle against the passion, on prayer, impassibility, and holy love. But faced with the combined attack on Constantinople by the Avars and the Persians, repulsed only through the miraculous assistance of the Mother of God, the monks were obliged to disperse. St. Maximus departed, embarked on an itinerant life. He had from now on to bear witness through his life and his writings to the loving kindness of God in the aftermath of the Persian invasions with the empire on the brink of catastrophe. While staying in Crete, he began to struggle for the orthodoxy by confronting the Monophysite theologians. Then he spent some time in Cyprus and in 632 arrived at Carthage. There he met and put himself under the spiritual direction of St. Sophronius, a theologian renowned for his orthodoxy and with profound understanding of, the, of monastic tradition, who was staying at the monastery of Ephrata with other monks who had fled from Palestine after the fall of Jer Jerusalem to the Persians. During these years, 626 to 34. Before he was engaged in the struggle for the faith, St. Maximus was able, in his exposition of the philosophical and theological foundations of Orthodox spirituality, to sound, as no one before him, the depths of the doctrine of deification. In profound and complex treatises on the difficult passages of Holy Scripture, on problems raised by St. Dionysius the Areopagite and St. Gregory the Theologian, and in his writings on the Holy Liturgy, St. Maximus presents a magnificent theolo theological synthesis. He sees man as placed by God in the world to be the priests of the cosmic liturgy and as called upon to gather together the inner principles, the logi, of all things in order to offer them to the divine word, the Logos, their principle, in a free exchange of love, so that in fulfilling the plan for which he has been created, his union with God, he also leads the entire universe to perfection in Christ, the God-man. Ever since his ascension to the throne, Emperor Heraclius had striven to reorganize the Shanket Roman Empire and prepare 
for a counteroffensive against a Persian by a series of administrative and military reforms, and above all by re-establishing unity among Christians, lest the Monophysites turn to the Persians or the Arabs. Obedient to the wishes of the emperor, Sergius, patriarch of Constantinople, devised a dogmatic formula capable of satisfying the Monophysites without denying the Council of Chalcedon. According to this compromised doctrine of monoenergism, the human nature of Christ would have remained passive and neutralized, the energy proper to it having been absorbed by the energy of the Word of God. In fact, this was no more than a matter of thinly disguised monophysitism, where the term nature was replaced by that of energy. In 630, the emperor appointed Cyrus of Phasis as patriarch of Alexandria with the mission of bringing about union with the Monophysites who were par particularly numerous in Egypt. No sooner was the union signed than talk in the taverns of Alexandria was how the Chalcedonians had been won to the Monophysite cause, and St. Sophronius was alone in raising his voice in defense of the two natures of Christ. He made his way to Alexandria to visit Cyrus, who, wishing to avoid an open rift, sent him on to Sergius at Constantinople. After a long discussions with no real result, Sophronius found himself forbidden to pursue any further the debate on the natures and the energies. He returned to Palestine, where he was welcomed by the people as a pillar of orthodoxy and elected patriarch of Jerusalem at the very moment when the Arabs were invading the country and entering upon a train of conquests which would imperil the empire more than ever before. Upon his election, St. Sophronius published an encyclical letter in which he made clear that Christ is one person having two natures and two operations or energies, and each nature possessing the energy proper to it. Meanwhile, still at Carthage, St. Maximus warily entered the dogmatic struggle to support his spiritual father, and while respecting the prohibition against speaking of the two energies, he showed with finesse that Christ accomplishes in virtue of his manhood what belongs to his Godhead, namely his miracles, and his virtue, and in virtue of his Godhead, what belongs to his manhood, may, may, namely his life-giving passion. But in 638, when the emperor Heraclius published his ecthesis, an edict reiterating the prohibition against speaking of the two energies and making acknowledgment of a single will in Christ obligatory on all, St. Maximus had to lay caution aside and come out with a public statement of the truth. In fact, St. Sophronius had died that same year and Maximus now was now regarded by all as the most authoritative spokesman of orthodoxy, once again, at the time of St. Athanasios or St. Basil, support of the true faith depended only on one man. In this many letters addressed to the Pope of Rome, to the emperor, and to the people of influence in the state, as well as treaties of unsurpassed depth, Maximus the Wise showed that the word of God, through an infinite love and respect for his creature, has assumed human nature in its entirety, altering nothing of its freedom. Free to draw back from the passion is inasmuch as a man, he voluntarily submitted to the divine will and plan, thus opening to us the way of salvation by submission and obedience. Human freedom united perfectly to the absolute freedom of God and the person of Christ, thus finds itself restored in the natural movement towards union with God, and with other men through love. Those things which the experience of prayer and of contemplation had permitted him to catch sight of, Maximus was henceforth able to expound, basing the doctrine of deification on, of man on the theology of the Incarnation. No father of the church before him had gone so deeply into the examination of human freedom and of its union with God and the person of Christ and in the person of each saint. With St. Maximus, the Orthodox doctrine of the Incarnation receives its most complete exposition. It only remained for St. John of Damascus to present it, in, it later in a more accessible manner, 
in order to pass on it on to future generations as an unchanging tradition. Sergius of Constantinople died in 638, and the next patriarch, Pyrrhus, was a keen advocate for the new heresy. However, despite official pressure, a large proportion of Christians resisted the tenor of the imperial decree, and shortly before his death in 641, Heraclius was obliged to recognize that his ecclesiastical policy had failed. Pyrrhus, who had fallen from favor, fled to Africa and faced St. Maximus at Carthage in a public disputation on the person of Christ. Settling forth the mystery of salvation with reasoning of unwavering vigor, the saint succeeded in making Pyrrhus recognize his errors and the patriarch offered to go to Rome in order to himself cast the anathema on monothelitism before the tomb of the apostles. However, he returned to his vomit soon after and fled to Ravenna. Pope Theodore excommunicated him straight away and condemned Paul, his successor, to the throne of Constantinople for heresy. Fearing that an open breach with Rome would aggravate the political situation, which was more critical than ever now that the Arabs had overrun Egypt, the Emperor Constans II responded to the Pope's intervention by publishing the Tipos, which forbade all Christians on pain of severe punishment to discuss the two natures and the two wills. The Orthodox now began to be harassed and persecuted, especially the monks and friends of St. Maximus. He himself went to join Pope Martin I in Rome, who, adamant in the defense of the true faith, assembled a Lateran council, which condemned monothelitism and rejected the imperial edict. Inflamed with wrath at the opposition, the Emperor Constant sent an exarch to Rome at the head of the army. The Pope, sick and powerless, was arrested and taken with much ill treatment on the way to Constantinople. He was condemned there as a criminal, subjected to public insult, and exiled thence to Cherson, where he died in the most wretched conditions in September of 655. As for St. Maximus, he had been arrested shortly before, the, before St. Martin. Together with his faithful disciples, Athanasius and another Athanasius, the, Pope, the Pope's apocrisiary, he had already spent many months in prison before coming before the same tribunal that had so odiously passed the sentence on Bishop of Rome. It was made to appear that the champion of orthodoxy was on trial for political offenses. He was accused of obstinate resistance to imperial authority, of having favored the Arab conquests of Egypt and Africa, furthermore, of having shown division in the church by his doctrine. With his mind fixed on God and with love for his enemies, the saint answered the lying imputations with unruffled calm, denying that he held any particular doctrine of his own, he declared that he was ready to break communion with all the patriarchates and even die rather than throw his conscience into confusion by betray betraying the faith. Condemned to exile, he was taken to Bizia in Thrace, while his disciples Athanasius was transported to Pisbiris and the other Athanasius to Misembria. In the court of his trial, St. Maximus heard the new Pope, Evgenius, I was prepared to accept a compromise in exposition of the faith, alleging a third energy in Christ. He therefore wrote a letter to Rome, setting out the Orthodox doctrine. This resulted in a revolt of the people and the Pope accepting consecration without consent of the Emperor. It was by this time, Sectar Creation without it was by this time clear to Constance that he would be unable to win over the Orthodox until he had prevailed with Maximus. He therefore sent the bishop Theodosius and two able courtiers to reason with him. In spite of his long imprisonment and all that he had suffered in exile, Maximus had lost nothing of his self possession. He easily dealt with their arguments and set out once again the orthodox doctrine and ended by calling with tears upon the emperor and the patriarch to repent and return to the true faith. The response of the emperor's delegates was to throw themselves at him like wild animals, heap insults on him, and cover him with spittle. 
St. Maximus was deported to Purbius, where he remained in prison with Athanasius for six years until 662, when they were both brought back to Constantinople to face a new trial before the patriarch and the, his synod. What church do you belong to then? He was asked to Constantinople, to Rome, to Antioch, to Alexandria, to Jerusalem, for you see that all are united with us to the Catholic Church, which is the right and salutary confession of faith in, the, in God of the universe. The confessor answered, threatened with the capital punishment, he replied, May whatever God has foreordained before all the age, before all the ages find in me the conclusion which resounds in the glory that has been his since before all the ages. After defaming and cursing them, the ecclesiastical court handed St. Maximus and his companions to the city prefect. He had them scourge and ordered their tongues and right hands to be cut off, being the members with which they were had witnessed their confession. Covered in blood, they were paraded about the city prior to deportation to the Caucasus. There they were imprisoned in separate fortresses in Lazica. It was there on the 13th of August, 662, that St. Maximus, at the age of 82, was divinely united to the word of God, whom he had lo so loved and whose life-giving passion he had imitated by confession of faith and martyrdom. It is said that every night three lambs symbolizing the Holy Trinity lit themselves above his tomb. The right hand of St. Maximus is venerated today at the monastery of St. Paul on Mount Athos. By the prayers of the holy St. Maximus, the confessor, may the Lord God have mercy on us and save us. God bless you. We're here for you. We love you. Don't hesitate to reach out. Call us, email us, leave us a message on social media, leave us a note in the comment section. If you'd like to support this ministry, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Again, God bless you. We're here for you. Have a beautiful rest of your day.